I believe that if you think that you are powerless against food, that you will always be a weight loss surgery patient, that you will always need follow-up, I'm telling you, ultimately, you're gonna fail at your surgery. Hello, I'm Dr. Doc Vong, world-famous weight loss surgeon, author of 12 books with three more books on the way. My, fam my famous book is The Ultimate Gastric Sleep Success. I've also been on TLC's hit TV show, 900 Pound Man, you might have seen that. I also have a ton of content and stuff on YouTube. I'm so happy to be talking to you today. Today I'm gonna to talk about a very controversial topic called, when do you stop being a weight loss surgery patient? This is a very important topic, okay? When do you stop being a weight loss surgery patient. Now, a lot of you watching this are going, uh, never Dr. Vong, it's a lifetime follow up. It's, uh, I always have to take care, I'm, I'm a food addict. I'm, uh, you know, uh, I, I can't control my weight so I always have to be a weight loss surgery patient. All right, I'm gonna tell you, maybe, maybe not. It's the same comparison and I often ask my friends who are alcoholics and they're in recovery, and I always ask them like, when do you quit being an alcoholic? And some people, they feel like they have to be an alcoholic for the rest of their lives. I don't know about that. And I wanna tell you a couple of tips, uh, make you think, make, keep the conversation and the discussion going, and then I'm gonna tell you some secret insider shit about surgeons and what we are plotting, what they are plotting for you, uh, what the medical industry complex, surgical complex, it's a huge, you know, y'all have to admit, the medical complex is a huge machine that profits and benefits off of your sickness, and they don't want you to get healthy. So I'm gonna tell you about some sneaky shit that's coming up in the next um, year or two years that you gotta watch out for, okay? So, don't dismiss this talk, it's very important. When do you stop being a weight loss surgery patient? All right, here we go. Tip number one. This is what I'm gonna tell you, okay? I believe that if you think that you are powerless against food, that you will always be a weight loss surgery patient, that you will always need follow-up, I'm telling you, ultimately, you're gonna fail at your surgery, ultimately. If you live long enough, you will fail your surgery, all right? Now that's hard for me to say, but I'm pretty sure it's true, and I'm gonna tell you why it's true, okay? It's because when you feel that way, like I'm always a food addict, I can't control myself around chocolate, junk food, I'm a stress eater, I'm an emotional eater, that means you're coming from a disempowered standpoint. You are disempowered. That's why I can't <laughs> hang around with too many recovering alcoholics because they are so disempowered. When they travel or go somewhere, the first thing they do is try to find an Alcoholics Anonymous so they don't drink. Now my question is, dude, you've been sober for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Why do you still need to keep going to these Alcoholics Anonymous stuff? And they'll say, well, it keeps me on track. And my answer is, does it keep you on track or does it keep you a prisoner? Oh shit, think about that. When you go, I'm always a food addict. I will always be a weight loss surgery patient. Is it keeping you on track or is it disempowering you? Is it keeping you a prisoner, okay? My suggestion to you, and no, I've never struggled with my weight, I have my own issues, <laughs> but I deal with a lot of y'all. I'm gonna tell you, you might wanna consider that it's a disempowering standpoint, and maybe you should reassess it and spin it to an empowering standpoint, and I'm gonna tell you how to do that here in a little bit, okay? Tip number two, are you always going to be a weight loss surgery patient. Tip number two is this. Now, don't run off and say, I'm no longer a food addict. I'm no longer, Dr. Vogg says that, you know, I don't have to be a food addict. So I'm just gonna eat whatever I want. I'm gonna just gonna, you know, don't lean on willpower, right? That's tip number two is 
Don't go into it without a plan. That's another mistake. So don't go from one mistake to another mistake, okay? So don't be like, I'm, I'll show you, I'm just gonna fill my house full of junk food and not eat it. No, 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 that's bad, that's bad. That's like walking into like traffic and saying, I don't see the cars, I don't see the cars, so I'm not gonna get hit, like don't do that. So you have to have a plan. And the plan that you wanna focus on, it's not the stuff that your surgeons are telling you, right? It's not like, um, you know, like food journal and learn recipes, okay? Even those things. Now, I, I teach my patients stuff like that. I always teach them to food journal, but I think a gratitude journal is much more important. Probably the number one journal you should take. You should keep the number two journal is probably a goal setting journal. Um, so, you know, you, you do need to take, keep a food journal, but in a certain way, think about it. If you're always counting calories, if you like can't go to a party because there's gonna be birthday cake there, that is also a dis disempowering standpoint, right? So, so you wanna approach this with a plan in place, an empowerment plan. So empowerment, I want you to think of empowerment as a muscle. Just like willpower is a muscle. Everybody goes, man, if, I'm just, if I just had the willpower, I could do it. Well, shit, Mary, you have not exercised your willpower for a long time. I want you to think of willpower as a muscle. And when we work a muscle, it gets stronger. If we don't use that muscle, what happens? <laughs> it atrophies, it goes away. Right? And I'm here to tell you, I love you. You know I love you. But most of y'all have been struggling with your weight for a long time. No one got fat overnight. Is that the truth? Give me some amens. So if that's the truth, if you're someone who's been overweight for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, or you've been overweight your whole life, then your willpower muscle is not very strong, man. It's atrophied. You probably don't have it. So... To think that you can go to a birthday party or a girls' night out or a cruise and somehow stay away from the junk food and the tempting food, it's fool's gold. It's fool's gold. You need a better plan. So here's what we're going to do, all right? We're going to start exercising your empowerment muscle and your willpower muscle. So the first thing you're going to do is start keeping not a food journal, but a gratitude journal, gratitude journal, man. If you want your life to change right now, start, if I could tell you one thing to do, to actually do, would be every single day, and sometimes, some of us, <laughs> twice a day, three times a day, is to write down in a journal, let me show you mine, all the things that you're grateful for. Does that make sense? Just, I have a ton of notes in here. Just jot in your journal things you're grateful for. I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful and you know, I'm grateful for my sobriety. I'm grateful for my husband. I'm grateful for my kids. I'm grateful for a roof over my house. And just take 30 seconds. Don't take longer than 30 seconds. You don't, it's not a big thing out of your day. You just write it down, okay? Because that, that gratitude is gonna change your shift. So I'll give you an example, right? Because kids are very important. I'm grateful for my kids. I'm grateful for my kids. I'm grateful for my grandbabies. I'm grateful for my grandbabies. When you write that enough times, then you have to, then it sinks in that, well, I need to be around for my kids. I need to be around for my grandbabies. And if I need to be around for them, then that means I don't need this piece of cake. I need to lose more weight. I need to work on you know, my health. I need, I need to do my follow-ups. I need to do what I need to do to be around for my kids. Does that make sense? But it starts by saying, I am grateful. So you exercise your willpower and, and your empowerment muscle, not by staring at a piece of chocolate cake and not eating it. That doesn't work, because you will eat that damn cake, right? You'll, you will eat that cookie. 
you exercise your willpower muscle by a gratitude journal. And I promise you, if there are areas in your life that you need to change and work on, it's a gratitude journal. That's what you need to do. That's what you need to start writing your gratitude about, okay? Um, your willpower is a muscle. So the flip side is this, and that's, this is the purpose of our video today. I'm always going to be a weight loss patient. I'm always a food addict. I'm always powerless around chocolate. I'm a chocoholic. I'm a stress eater. Every time you say shit like that, you are exercising your powerlessness muscle. You're exercising your lack of control muscle. You're exercising your, your lack of willpower muscle when you say things like, I'm always going to be a food addict. I would suggest that you stop that. I would suggest you start, you know, I would suggest you start calling yourself by different terms. I'm a badass, I'm strong, I'm powerful, I'm cute, I did it, I'm helpful, I'm kind. And that's what you always wanna say. Now tip number, next one, to write down, okay? Now they've studied this, okay? Every time, the average person, this is where they fuck up, so pay attention. The average person thinks, number one, I'm not gonna tell myself negative thoughts, look at me being all positive, not true. <laughs> And then they'll think, if I do say something negative, then I will just say something nice about myself. A one-to-one -one ratio. Ah, Doc, you, you just really screwed that up. You should have been nicer. Well, at least I tried. And you think that one and one will cancel it out. And the answer is no. Here's the science behind this. It's a one to five. If you tell yourself one negative thing, pay attention, you have to tell yourself, Five, how many? Five positive things to make up for that one negative thing. That's the science, all right? That's not Dr. Vong just kind of blowing shit up your ass. That's the science behind it. So if you sit there and say, I'm such a klutz, well, guess what you owe me, bitch? You owe me five positive things about yourself, okay? You have to say, at least I'm nice, I'm kind, I work hard, I try to help people, I'm sincere, uh, I didn't eat the cookie today. <laughs> okay? That, that's, the, that's the basic starting formula if you want to get away from the prison that weight loss surgery has created for you. Now that's very powerful. Think about what I just said. I'm a weight loss surgeon, I used to be. And I was a culprit. I was a part of the system that created a prison for you that said that you were powerless. And about eight years ago, I started creating content because I realized that what I was telling people wasn't true. You're not in a prison. You are all powerful. You can do a lot of great shit. And you deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve a great life. You deserve um, magnificence and beauty and excitement and passion, right? And we, as a medical complex, have been telling you that you're powerless. You need to diet. You can't control yourself around stress and cookies and chips and birthday cake and it's bullshit, all right? And I will be back with the next one on that. Okay, all right. Tip number three, guys. You guys ready for tip number three? How long are you gonna be a weight loss surgery patient? I'm about to give you some insider shit right now. You guys don't know this, but the biggest conversation the weight loss surgeons are having right now, shh, this is secret shit. The biggest conversation we are having at our national meetings right now is, what to do about all of the weight loss surgery failures. They're calling them failures. Now, I don't call them failures, but that's what they're calling. They're debating, oh, sleeve has heartburn. Do you convert them to a bypass? Oh, what do you do for a bypass who's regained weight? It's like we've brushed it all underneath the carpet. You guys don't understand it, right? Because you guys 
go to a seminar about weight loss surgery and they're telling you that this is permanent weight loss, which is bullshit. It's not permanent weight loss. There's no, there's only two things that are permanent in this world. What are they? Death and taxes. Not weight loss surgery. It is not forever. Okay, it's not permanent. But you go to a seminar and they say, oh, this is permanent weight loss. And they'll say, you'll never feel hungry again. That's bullshit. You will feel hungry again. And I've always taught you that. Why? Because it's natural to be hungry. It's unnatural to be full. It's natural to be hungry. And who are the only people in this world who never feel hungry? That's right. Dead people. Dead people are the only ones who never get hungry. Not weight loss surgery patients. Most weight loss surgery patients will regain their sense of hunger within six months to two years. There's a few people who wake up from surgery. Everything in life's a bell curve. So there are a few people who wake up from surgery, swear that they were hungry from the second that they woke up from weight loss surgery. And there are people that are like four or five years out that say, I'm still never hungry. But the vast majority of people will regain their sense of hunger within a year, okay? That's the average, I'm just telling you. But we don't talk about that in weight loss surgery community world. I'm the only crazy ass dude talking to you. So the argument we're talking about or the discussion, the primary discussion in the weight loss surgeon groups that y'all don't know about, our professional societies, all the meetings we go to is what to do about all the failures. What are our options? And that's terrible. And they hate me because I stand up and I say, fuckers, you should have fixed their head first. You should be providing them with better information. You should be dealing with their stressors, their psychology, their behavior, their spiritual, their bro you know, they're broken down spiritually, emotionally. They've been damaged. They've been abused. They've, they've had issues. They have money issues. They're, they have daughters who are addicted to drugs. They have all sorts of issues that we're not addressing. And the response I get from surgeons is what? I'm a surgeon. That's why I give them to their psychiatrist or their therapist or we've got social workers for that. Listen, y'all don't want, our patients don't want to hear from, from some nutritionist. They want to hear from the surgeon, amen? Right? You want to hear from the surgeon, okay? So, that's the dirty secret. Now, let me tell you, give me some more details. All right, pay attention. I'm going to give you some more details, Okay. Number one, so right now they're talking about sleeves. Since sleeves are the most popular surgery, there's a group of surgeons saying that the sleeve's a bad surgery. There's some surgeons trying to figure out what do you do about heartburn after sleeve. Some surgeons are debating about weight regain after sleeve. They're pushing uh, the mini gastric bypass. They're trying to do this SIPS called single, you know, like a one anastomosis do a deal switch. I'm telling y'all they're all gonna fail if you don't work with the psychology. Yes? And I don't mean psychology as in like depression, schizophrenia, not that, not the bullshit medical psychology, the personal development psychology, the self-confidence, the self-worth, the um, feeling that you are worth it, that you belong, that you deserve more. That's what I'm talking about. The psychology behind what makes us humans, makes us awesome. That's what we need to deal with, okay? Because you can always chase a different surgery. So. Dirty secret number, next one. <laughs> they are trying shit that I know is not going to work. They've got newer surgeries. Now, some of y'all have already fallen for some of these newer surgeries. Let me give you an example. Gastric balloons, do not, if you are a Dr. V fan, do not go get a gastric balloon. That shit will not work. Number one, it's not covered by insurance, so you're gonna pay $6,000 out of pocket to have a balloon put into your stomach that's supposed to make you feel full sooner. But guess what? By FDA guidelines, they have to take it out within six months. They're, those balloons cannot be in there more than six months. They should not be. If they're in there more than a year, you're, you're liable. I don't know about you, but $6,000 for something that's supposed to be there for six months to a year? Dude! That's a lot of fruits and vegetables I could buy with $6,000, amen? And they're just gonna take it out? Crazy. And the average weight loss with gastric balloons is only 20 pounds. Now, most of my patients will lose 20 pounds by just following the Dr. V diet before surgery. So, don't fall for the gastric balloons. Now, if you already have a gastric balloon, I'm not making fun of you. It's okay, it's all right. 
Just learn the psychology. Just start making those changes. So gastric balloons. Now, next cert, new surgery you're going to see them talking about is endoscopic stuff. By endoscopic, they're going to try to do sell you, sell you on an endoscopic sleeve. They're going to put a tube down your, your throat and they're going to try to sew your stomach from the inside to give it the shape of a sleeve. But they're not taking out any stomach. They're trying to tell you that um, you less risk of a leak, it's less invasive, etc. Let me tell you, it won't work. It won't work long term. It, technically, it's very hard. So you have to have a surgeon. It's a newer, sur a newer per approach and technique, right? Like, I'm, I'm telling y'all, when, when these new surgeons are trying to do this endoscopic sleeve through a tube through your mouth, you're gonna have such a wide range of results because it's called a learning curve. <laughs> As surgeons, we talk about the learning curve. How long does it take a surgeon to learn a bypass, a sleeve, to make their sleeves look the same, to make this endoscopic sleeve look the same? It's going to be a fucking train disaster, train wreck. We're going to hurt um, our profession, right? Because it's not covered by insurance, so they're so you're going to pay six to eight thousand dollars out of pocket, and that's going to line the surgeon's pocket. I'm telling you because it's the fucking truth, and no one's saying it. These surgeons are pushing the gastric balloons and the uh, endoscopic sleeves because they're not covered by insurance and because they get paid a lot more than if they just did a good sleeve or a good bypass. You got me? It's a money issue, which takes me back to the whole thing why I'm trying to help you with your money, okay? So, I would avoid a gastric uh, uh, endoscopic sleeve. Another thing that you're about to see on the horizon is something called the Aspire Assist. A-S-P-I-R-E, Aspire Assist. As in, you're aspiring to be a real surgery. All right? This is the dumbest fucking surgery, and people are having this done. It's available in Europe. It was just approved in America about a year and a half, maybe two years ago now. It's basically a feeding tube. It's a peg tube that's bigger that goes, and you have a little button, yeah, that sticks out of your stomach. You actually see this little button, like a peg tube, that sticks out of your stomach, and, you're, and the patient is supposed to eat food, chew it up really well, eat slowly, but once they're done eating, check this crazy ass shit out, once they're done eating, they go to the bathroom, they connect that button to a pump, that sucks the food out of their stomachs into this pump, into this reservoir that they then dump into the toilet. One more time, a patient has a feeding tube that's big. They're supposed to eat food. Once they're done eating, there's a pump that they connect to that tube that pumps out what they just ate, and then they dump that into the trash. Now, I don't know about you, but that, in my opinion, is called surgical bulimia. And if we think that bulimia is so bad that it's, a, it's in your DSM-4, you know, your psychology, psychiatry manuals that people get admitted for bulimia, why the fuck are we causing it? It's called surgical bulimia. And, I, and I ha I've had this debate on Facebook, in conferences, at meetings, with other surgeons, and they say, shut up, Dr. Vong, you don't understand the data, you don't understand the results. The data is good. It shows 30% excess weight loss or whatever. Who the fuck cares? I don't care if it's 100% successful. At some point it's gonna fail because you're telling the patient that you cannot control yourself around food so you gotta pump it out. That somehow this is okay but you're but your niece who's making herself throw up is somehow messed in the head, but you, because you've had a surgery, that that's okay? This is screwed up, but this is what they're gonna be pushing. This is what your surgeons are pushing in the next few years, it's coming out, as a, in addition to other surgeries. You're gonna start seeing them do shit to your sleeves. All right, pay attention. They're gonna start telling you you need a sleeve to a bypass. 
They're gonna start telling you you need to put a lap band around your sleeve. They're gonna start telling you you need to go, you already have a sleeve, they're gonna do this endoscopic thing and they're gonna re-sleeve you from the inside. Don't fall for it. Because most of it's not covered by insurance so they're just making more money. Get your head straight. Get your money straight. Get the negative people out of your life. Kick people to the curb. Do the hard work. Come to conferences. Now, I lost a bunch of followers and had people say negative shit about me on Facebook and, and my YouTube channel because they think I'm peddling tickets to my conferences or my book sales or my online course. Hell yeah, I am! Because where else are you gonna get this real information? Do you think the hotel is free? I have to pay for Caesar's Palace. It's $50,000. So yes, I'm gonna sell you to a ticket. It includes your food. I've gotta pay for the hotel for you to have food. What is wrong with people? Oh, that should be for free. He's just trying to make money. I'm trying to cover my cost and help you. And I spent a lot of money going to med school. Somehow it's okay for me to spend money to go to med school but somehow it's bad when I try to get you to spend money for your own education to come to one of my conferences. See, people are very confused. I've had some motherfuckers say, Dr. Vong, you should give your books away for free. What? As if Amazon gives it to me for free. Like, I have to pay Amazon. What is wrong with people? But I love them, and the reason why I love them is because... It's because... They are very confused about money and they don't understand how the world works. And when they say stuff like that, if, they, if that's their perception about money, then it makes me understand their perception about like other areas of their life, what they value. Um, I promise you, if they say something like that, it tells me a lot about their insight into spirituality, into what they believe in their God, it gives me a lot of insight about how much suffering they have because I promise you they suffer in their lives in other areas. They're eating McDonald's. They, they're, I promise you that asshole who thinks I should give my books away, he does not treat his wife well. I guarantee you he does not take her to nice restaurants. He does not take her to plays and date nights, right? Because how can a dude tell me I need to give my books away for free and be willing to treat his wife well. They don't go together. Does that make sense? And frankly, I don't want him following me. And the 162 of you right now watching, the 200 people that were on this Facebook Live today, I want you to be my fans because I know you're giving up your time and your Saturday morning to watch me. And I know you're gonna go back and rewatch this because I gave you some crazy ass shit. Your surgeons, the medical complex, is keeping you trapped in your weight loss surgery prison. It benefits them to keep you trapped in your weight loss surgery prison. You need to, because they will say, you, you're a patient for life. You need to follow up forever. You are powerless against food. You don't know how to think for yourself. Come back and see me. The difference is they're selling you on a doctor's visit, lab work, and another surgery in the future. I'm saying, and those things will keep you a prisoner. I'm saying buy my $7 online course and free yourself. Come to my workshop for $200 the whole weekend for $300 and free yourself once and for all. Come to my Vegas conference and get around kick-ass people, see what's possible. Meet Debbie, who's a freaking size four, one of my patients. Meet my patients who've lost 200 pounds. Be inspired and free yourself. Does that make sense? And once you free yourself, then you'll be able to help others. You'll be able to help your kids, your friends, your family, your church, um, your other sleep brothers and sisters, your other weight loss surgery patients, right? That's what this is about.
That's what this whole talk's about. That's what this journey needs to be about. You have to eventually stop saying you're a weight loss surgery patient because it keeps you in a prison. And as long as you're in a prison, number one, you can't live the life you want. Number two, you can't become the person that you are destined to be, that your creator, that your God created you to be. And number three, you can't help others. You can't help others. I hope you've enjoyed this Facebook Live. Um, I appreciate you very much. And I hope to see you and meet you sometime in the future. Cool? Thank you guys for watching.